Okay. Well, I'm not Jesse. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, all right. So <clears throat> thank you for coming this morning. Um, I wanted to start out by sharing um, sorry, here. how much uh, Sam and I love this church. Um, in preparing for the sermon, I was <clears throat> thinking over the last three or four years, you know, the process of moving up here from Illinois to be a part of this church plant. And it's really stretched us spiritually, um, a lot of highs and a lot of lows. And I thank God for all of those, you know, all the, all the good and the lows and, you know, what I saw in my mind. Um, but yeah, we love this church. And so <clears throat> this is the first time I've ever preached. Um, so uh, if this were work, uh, preaching would be a stretch goal for me. Um, so like Ross was saying, I, I hope at the end of this, you know, you've completely forgotten about me. And your, your thoughts are just really on how awesome God is and how, per, how powerful his word is. Um, today I'll be preaching on Psalm 139. This is one of those sections of scripture that just, it kind of just keeps coming up in my life, um, whether it be a verse of the day or, <clears throat> you know, I'll be listening to a sermon or someone will send me a passage um, or I'll be listening to a song and I'll be like, yeah, like these lyrics are great. And I'll go look them up and I'm like, yeah, Psalm 139 again. <laughs> so... Um, It's just one of those, it just keeps coming up. I find comfort in this chapter. Um, Peace about things I can't control in life. Joy, freedom, and fear of God, really. Um, So let us pray, and we'll get into it. Lord God, you are high and holy. You're so far above us, Lord. We can barely reach up and grasp any concept of you. Please open your word to us today. Help us to expand our perspective on you. Help us to have an accurate view of you, Lord. Um, We thank you for allowing us to experience you in your ways. And uh, I pray throughout this message, you get all the honor, praise, and glory that you deserve. Amen. All right, so Psalm 139. It's said to be one of the grandest psalms. Um, It was possibly written by David when he was being made king of Israel. Um, some think, though, that it was written when he was being accused of being a traitor by Saul. But you can see at the end, based on the language at the end of the chapter, it appears he's facing some kind of distress or some kind of opposition. <clears throat> Throughout this passage, you get to see some of the infinite attributes of God. You get to see his omniscience. He's all-knowing. His omnipresence. He's present everywhere at all times. His omnipotence, he has unlimited power. When I started studying these characteristics, or, or as I've studied these, <clears throat> when you start thinking about them, if you think about them deeply for a few minutes, it's, <laughs> it's easy to possibly be confused or discouraged. Like, how could God possibly know everything? How could he possibly be everywhere at all times? Um, it's easy to start trying to limit God too, right? We start thinking, him, thinking of him as someone that knows just a little bit more than we do. Or we try to take this unlimited God and, and put him into our worldview. It doesn't fit in my worldview, so this God can't be this way. <clears throat> and that's really the worst thing we can do is doubt who God says he is just because we can't comprehend it. The word reminds us in several places, though, that he really is too much for us to fully grasp Um, I think that's a good thing, right? Who could manage the earth without these qualities? What immense knowledge you would need. What an incredible amount of space the whole universe is. Um, What an immeasurable amount of power it must must take to sustain all all of this, all that we do. Psalm 145 reminds us, his greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is beyond searching out or discovering fully. Sorry, I'm feeding back here. His greatness is too much for us to ever be fully known by us. Um, Psalm 147 says, His understanding is beyond measure. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, No one comprehends the things of God except the Spirit of God. And lastly, you see God talking in Isaiah 55, and he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We need to keep you know, that perspective in mind as we go through this chapter. And um, I hope that through this message that you're filled with praise and worship at the end, you're thinking about, God, you are amazing. All right, so let's read Psalm 139. <clears throat> o Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? <clears throat> or where shall, I, well, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, <clears throat> even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted, together, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast the sum of them. If I, could count them there, if I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, so yes, um, my big idea today and the title of my sermon is God's greatness is beyond all measure, completely beyond all of our ability to measure. So, David shows us several ways God is beyond all measure throughout this psalm. I really like how this passage is broken up into three sections that you can clearly see of God's attributes, and at the end, David's response. We're going to examine each verse and try to unpack what David's saying here to, to really um, get to you know, a better understanding of what um, God is like. And uh, the first way we see that God is beyond all measure is, is in his omniscience. So point number one, we are known by him down to the smallest detail. In verses one through six, David is expressing how vast God's knowledge of him is. God knows things about him that no one would ever know. God has knowledge of him that would be impossible for anyone to possess. The language used throughout this chapter is David's best ability to explain in man's terms, you know, explain God in man's terms, or from man's pers perspective. It's like he's trying to measure something with an inferior tool, or the wrong tool, since there really is no way to measure the infinite. Our, lang our language is even lacking. It's like how my kids try to measure something with spaghetti. <laughs> Verse number one, O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. <clears throat> the Lord is no passive observer. He's not taking in knowledge like we do. He's not sitting at the airport, people watching, and getting an idea of you know, what people are like. Uh, the word searched here is active. God's not passively pursuing David. He knows every detail about him entirely. God isn't passive or impersonal in knowing us either. 
Again, verse 1, you have searched me and know me. God is active in knowing us and understanding us. <clears throat> but one thing we must remember about God is um, he knows all things without any effort on his part. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't follow David around and try to understand him um, or get a better understanding of him. And I think this, you know, active searching, I think this can help us understand his intimacy with us. David continues in verse 2. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. He's familiar with all of our routines. He knows that I've had the same work hours for like the last 20 years and uh, around 8, 9 o'clock my, my body starts to, to break down and I start to get that panic. I'm not going to get enough sleep. I got to get to bed so I can get up early for work in the morning. He also knows that no matter how busy we were the day before or what we were doing the day before, as soon as the smallest amount of light hits my kids' windows, they're awake. And it doesn't matter if it's 5.30 a.m. or whatever, 6 a.m. He knows I'm most encouraged and filled with a heart of worship and praise on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> he knows that if I don't spend time with him in, time with him in the morning, reading his word and having a quality prayer time, I'm likely to have a selfish and sinful day. He knows all of our routines, all of our patterns. And he discerns our thoughts from afar. Before a thought has even entered your mind, God knows it completely and fully understands it. Just think about that for a second. Before it's even entered your mind, he knows it completely. He fully understands it. He knows what motivated this thought and all its implications. Like, why did you come to this? He understands how all of our thoughts connect together. Have you ever just been doing something and something just pops in your mind and you're like, why did that come into my mind? <laughs> why did that come up? Why am I thinking about this situation or whatever? I did a little research in <clears throat> preparing for this sermon. I was curious about how many thoughts humans have on a daily basis. There was some recent study that said somewhere around 6,000, but then some older studies have greater ranges, like 12 to 50,000 50, thoughts a day. I mean, if you think about it, 6,000 is a crazy amount. I could probably even, barely even summarize the things that I've thought of this morning. I mean, 6,000. Let me caution you. When your thoughts lead to stuff like, God can't be like this. He can't know everything. Know that our own thoughts can't even be trusted. Isn't that crazy? We lie to ourselves continually. Proverbs 28, 26 reminds us, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Also, we see in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But thankfully, he does. He keeps it all together. He knows. He understands all of our thoughts, all of our inner workings. David continues, <clears throat> you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. This word here, search out in Hebrew, it can mean to sift or to winnow. You sift my path, you winnow my path. It's a refinement, it's a removing of chaff. He's acquainted with all of David's ways, which way he'll go, what decisions he'll make. He's familiar with all of your patterns, all of your routines, all of your desires, hopes, temptations, certain proclivities to sin. We have to remember though, Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of the man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. He's going before us, removing chaff, guiding us. <clears throat> David continues, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, you know it altogether. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, you know it altogether. This verse has really helped me to go to him more in prayer or go to prayer more frequently. Just think about how we speak to one another. We say one thing, but we conceal what we really think. We all do this. You cannot do this with God. He sees all. In my sinfulness, I'm quick to think negative thoughts or, or judgment or be condescending or selfish. I've been praying this a lot lately. Lord, I'm quick to judge, quick to be harsh, quick to be prideful and arrogant. 
Please direct my thoughts and my words towards things that are honoring and pleasing to you, even before they're in my mind or on my lips. I don't want to think these things. I, I want to be, you know, pure. I want, to, <clears throat> I want the, the fruit of the Spirit to flow out of me. Help me to hide your word in my heart. So my first inclination when responding to something or thinking about something is of you and is good. And please prevent me, ultimately, from being sinful. You see it, Lord. Direct my path in another way so it's not of me. <clears throat> David continues in verse 5. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. I'd really like to quote uh, Spurgeon's commentary on this verse. The word picture is just it's excellent. He says, <clears throat> as though we were caught in an ambush or besieged by an army that is wholly beleaguered by the that has wholly beleaguered the city walls. We are surrounded by the Lord. Behind us, there is God recording our sins or in grace, blotting out the remembrance of them. And before us, there is God foreknowing all our deeds, providing for all our wants. <clears throat> we cannot turn back so to escape him, for he is behind. We cannot go forward and outmarch him, for he is before and lest there should seem any chance of escape or lest we should imagine that the surrounding presence is yet a distant one, it is added, and laid thy hand upon me. God is very near. We are holy in his power. From that power, there's no escape. This, should, this thought should be terrifying if you're living in sin or if you don't know Christ as your personal savior. Or it can be the most comforting idea. The God of the universe <laughs> rests his hand on me. My response is just like David's. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. David can't even fully comprehend it. God's greatness truly is beyond all measure. And these are just some very small examples. Some, you know, just a few word pictures about his knowledge. We need to consider the scale of God's knowledge, the total scope. Consider all of man's comings and goings. All of our thoughts, all of our actions. He knows all of these things. This is an amount we can't even come close to counting. I don't even think we could estimate it accurately. His knowledge is immeasurable, impossible to measure. This should cause us to want to worship and praise him. We should want to worship him because he's God. He's so much greater than us. If you think about it, <clears throat> there's almost no one that we share everything with about ourselves. Maybe a spouse, you share a lot. Maybe a brother or sister would know a lot, you know, growing up with you, going through a lot of experiences, or a longtime friend, a parent. But no one, no one can fully understand us like he does. They just can't. This is the most intimate relationship we have is with God. And our response to him should be vulnerability. It should be honesty. We should have a desire to come, with, come to him with everything and ultimately want to submit to him, submit to his way. Think about this for a second. <clears throat> he knows everything that you've done. He's had every opportunity to let us go because of our sin. But instead, he offers us grace and mercy. We stand completely exposed before God. Again, this can be a frightening position if it not be for the work of Christ our Savior. <clears throat> Some of you may know this about Sam and I, but when we were first married, we wanted to have a big family, um, <laughs> but we couldn't conceive. Um, one of her doctors initially told us we wouldn't be able to have kids. We did the whole fertility doctor thing, um, tests, appointments, drugs, injections, tests, appointments, drugs, injections, for a long time. Sam was driving, we were living in Rockford, she was driving to Crystal Lake a ridiculous amount to see this specialist. And I just remember crying out to God in this time, Lord, what is our family supposed to be like? Are we not supposed to have kids? Are we supposed to adopt? You have other plans for us? The whole time he could just see a few years ahead, 
that would be overrun with kids. <laughs> and there'd be almost more than we could possibly handle. <laughs> he sees the whole picture. He sees ahead. He knows. We see like this amount, and it's very easy for us to become discouraged. God, why is this happening? But he sees the whole picture. He sent good people to us, good friends that would pray for us, pray with us, try to help us through. It was tough. Call out to him in these times when all you see is this much. God, I don't understand my circumstance, but you know where this is going, and I trust you. So God is beyond all measure because he knows absolutely everything. Point number one, we are known by him down to the smallest detail. And point number two, we're always with him. There is no escaping him. He is present in all places at all times. This doesn't mean that part of him is present here, part of him is present there, or he's here and he has knowledge of what's going on over there and he'll go there when he needs to. He's fully present everywhere at all times. How does that make any sense? <laughs> Verse 7, David says, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Think about Adam and Eve for a minute. They sin, and then they foolishly think they can hide from God. They tried to hide. Doesn't that seem crazy when you're reading that? There's no one else, and they're hiding from God. <laughs> um, there's nowhere to hide from him. We do the same thing when we sin, though. We try to hide. We try to avoid him. We get into a pattern of sin. We avoid prayer. We avoid time in the word. We avoid the church. Then we try to seek things of this world to numb us, to distract us, or comfort us. <clears throat> we, ha- we have a strange way of being able to put things out of our mind quickly. Kind of ridiculous, isn't it? David continues, I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. In the good, you are there, Lord. In the bad, you are there. When I'm the one causing the bad, making the poor decisions, you are there. When everything seems to be going well, you are there. When I think things are crashing down all around me, it's you, Lord, that changes the circumstances or a lot of times you're just changing my perspective. He continues, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, this, free, this phrase here, takes the wings of the morning, is referring to the speed at which uh, light, morning light appears to fly across the sky when the sun first comes up. If I could travel that quickly to the most distant part of the sea, still, Lord, you are there. There's no escaping him. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Hold me. No matter our, our plans, our paths, our workings, he's still leading and upholding us. Hebrews 1 says, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Isaiah 41, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand, righteous right hand. A lot of times we're just like David in life. Um, I think he's preaching to himself here. I think he's reminding himself that God is everywhere, can see everything. He's reminding himself of the greatness of God, for he feared that darkness would engulf him, completely overtake him. Our circumstances can be overwhelming to the point uh, where it appears there's no positive outcome. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. God's not like you or I. He doesn't get overwhelmed. He sees the dark as clearly as light. There's no difference to him. We should run to him in these moments of darkness. He can see it. God is beyond all measure because <clears throat> he's absolutely everywhere in the universe at all times. He there. And God being near to us, present at, all, present at all times, should not be taken for granted. If you spend any time really thinking about this, that he's right here with me, 
You should be moved to more frequent prayer. Lord, I need help. Lord, be here with me. You should hopefully have a greater fear of sinning. He's right there while you're committing whatever sin. Hopefully thinking about this will help you fend off temptation more easily. Think about that. He's there with you. Some of you might say, yeah, but you don't really know what I'm going through, or this is more than I can stand, or this temptation is more than I can deal with. I'm weak to whatever. Remember that Jesus fully understands temptation. Hebrews 12, we see, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. If you haven't shed your own blood, then you haven't gone as far as he did to resist. You're never going something he's unaware of or something he doesn't understand. He's right there with you. Call out to him in your time of need. But what if he just don't feel it? I don't feel it. I don't feel God's presence. I've noticed in my own life, in my own walk, a couple of things that help me to feel it, if you will. First is being obedient to him. Sin corrupts completely. It takes away your desire to... It numbs us. It completely destroys us. It It destroys all my desire and my ability to be filled up by him if I'm living in sin. Two, look for ways to thank him. It's something simple, right? Look... Looking for things to thank him for. Thank you for continuing to provide for my family, Lord. Small things, large things. If you train your heart to look for things to be thankful for, you quickly start seeing him everywhere. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You just, it just, a thankful heart makes it much easier to see God. So this year, Sam and I set, spent, uh, set some personal family goals that we wanted to accomplish this year. Um, for me, I need to finish systematic theology, which I'm about a third through. Um, I need to learn to write some complicated SAS code for work, which I'm 0% of the way through. One of our family goals was to have more present time. We wanted to make sure we we're paying attention to each other. We were, uh, we were there for our kids, you know. We didn't want to always be staring at our phone or, you know, doing a project or something and ignoring them. <clears throat> we wanted us to, we wanted our kids to make sure that they knew we were there for them. We care for them. <laughs> we want to make sure that one of them is like, dad, 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 look what I'm doing. We don't miss their best moves. Just try to pay attention to two people talking to you at the same time or four kids and your wife all talking to you at the same time. You'll quickly see how limited you are. But this God is without limit. He's without measure. He really is the best father. He's like the dad you're telling a story to. You're going on and on. You look up to see if he's listening. You look at him, he's looking you right in the face. He's been following you the whole time. He's been listening to you the whole time. The greatness of God really is beyond all measure because we are known to him down to the smallest detail. We are always with him, and we are created by him. He has unlimited power, unlimited power. Not just more power and ability than us, unlimited power, no end to it. I think we really struggle with this idea of infinity. It's not a number. We can slightly grasp living on for eternity, right? A day, another day, tomorrow, the next day. We can understand that, right? Another day on top of another. But here's some homework for you. Try to wrap your mind around the fact that he has no beginning. He has no reference point. The best I can do to try to grasp this is to think, this is tomorrow, and it just goes on forever, and it's the same going backwards. There's a day before that and a day before that. It's very hard. He has the power over creation, over life, over death. Verse 13, he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. 
This passage is very important. It has many implications for how we view the unborn, how we deal with racial injustice. If God is knitting people together, creating them to be specifically who they are, we're forbidden from taking the life of the unborn out of convenience. We're also forbidden from looking down on others because of race, ethnicity, nationality. How can you possibly look down on anyone? I do this a lot when Sam and I are watching TV. It's like, oh, look at that person they look like, or they're like this, or whatever, you fill in the blank. Unless your comment or your thought is encouraging, it's likely in the wrong when you're thinking about others. If your thought isn't coming from love and compassion, it's likely unnecessary. Something Sam is always (laughs) preaching at home. Is it necessary? Is it encouraging? I need that. David continues, verse 14. <clears throat> I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Fearfully, when translated from Hebrew, means great reverence, heartfelt interest with respect. This sounds so intimate to me. We're not random. This is so deliberate with purpose. Wonderfully, when translated from Hebrew, can also mean unique or set apart. That's amazing. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. We're valuable to him. We have purpose. How many of our 6,000 thoughts a day or whatever are on things like, I'm not good enough. I'm not important. No one notices me. This is not true with God. He fearfully and wonderfully made you. He has purpose for your life. David says in the chapter before, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for your life as well. David keeps going. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, as yet there were none of them. This should really cause you to pause and think about his power. He saw you before you ever were. Every one of your days was written before you were created. Sometimes I go through periods of dryness or sin. I think things like, wow, I've been a Christian for a long time, and... I still sin this much? How come I quickly forget what Christ has done for me? I have thoughts that are basically disappointment in myself because I think I'm disappointing God. I think somehow I'm gonna hit his limit of grace. But what's amazing is he saw that moment before it happened. He knew I'd get myself into a bad routine, seeking him, of not seeking him, then feeling guilt, anger, emptiness, or sadness. When we come to these points in life, we need to repent and remember that it's Jesus that saves us and nothing of ourself. Think about this from before you were created. He knew you'd need salvation. He knew what we'd be like. He alone provides the way. David's response to this is excellent. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast the sum of them. David can't even comprehend the scale or the scope of the thoughts of God. This idea is very precious to him. He loves the thoughts of God. You should too. You should spend some time really thinking through this, these characteristics of God. It will create in you a heart of praise and worship and adoration. Verse 18, we see, David say, if I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. I imagine David's been thinking of the greatness of God all day and all night. He can't fully grasp it. How can you count all the sand on earth? You can't. This is David's attempt to measure the immeasurable. This is our limited language trying to describe God. Even our language is limited in our ability to describe God. He finally falls asleep thinking of the greatness of God. When he wakes up, God is still there with him. 
I hope the Lord is my first thought every morning. God's power is immeasurable. This is easily shown by creation. Man can't create anything out of nothing. We haven't been able to create anything out of nothing. He has a power over life and death. He deserves all the worship our hearts long for. He has the power to provide what you need in this world. And we need to believe in his power and know that he is the only good father. There's certain passages of the scripture that um, they just have more meaning to me now that I have kids. <clears throat> I look at my kids and my family and I think, I want to give you absolutely everything, right? I want to do everything that I can for you. I want to give you everything that you want that's good. This type of relationship, father to child, really helps us understand him better as a father. In Matthew, he says, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I can't imagine not loving my kids or trying to care for them with all my strength. The immeasurable God is an infinitely better Father than I could ever be. That gives me great comfort because sometimes when I'm doubting my relationship with him, I think about my relationship with my children and I realize he's so much higher. He is so much greater. So I do a lot of house projects for the wife, just like any good little husband does. Um, I've noticed the speed and quality at which I complete these projects has a direct impact on my marriage. So fast and accurate, marriage up. Slow, yeah, you get it. <laughs> Recently, we were working on something, and Sam said, I'm confident in your abilities. When you mess something up, you always find a way to fix it. I appreciate that. My daughter, <laughs> my daughter Evie thinks I have uh, the power to fix anything. One time, our power went out in all of Waterford, storm, power completely gone. Evie was completely, power, or, Evie was completely confident in me. She just says, it's okay, Dad. Just get your tools and you can fix it. <laughs> you can turn the power back on. So, God does have the power. He has the power over everything. <laughs> That's how we should view him, like a childlike faith, right? Okay, so we've seen the, great, the greatness of God <clears throat> is beyond all measure in three different ways. And this last section, verses 19 through 24, is my fourth point. His cause should be our cause, right? So we've seen he sees all, is everywhere, has all the power, and is good. Think about that for a, mad, a minute. Imagine God having all this power and knowledge but being dishonest or not having our best interest in mind. But he's good. He is good. Imagine God holding us accountable for all of our actions. Psalm 136 says over and over, his steadfast love endures forever. The longer I live as a Christian, the more powerful that, praise, or that phrase has become to me. His steadfast love endures forever. He is so patient with us, so merciful to us. We should desire what he desires. We should care about what he cares about. In my opinion, I think this is a prayer of someone that wants to be doing the will of God. I think that's what David is saying here. At first glance, it seems kind of strange for David to go from praising God in several ways to saying, I hate them with complete hatred. What is he talking about? But I think what he's saying is, God's cause is his cause. Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Oh God, oh men of blood, depart from me. David is asking God to destroy those around him that are wicked, those that seek his life unjustly. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. David is taking offense to how the wicked speak of God, how they take his name in vain. If you've experienced his grace, his mercy, his providence in your life, it's easy to become upset when you see someone disregard the Lord or his ways. I think that's what David's doing here. Do I not hate those that hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those that rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Those who are against you, Lord, I'm also against. Those that hate you and take your name in vain, I'm against them as well. Your enemies are my enemies. We should detest sin. 
and the wickedness this world offers. Verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if, there's, if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. These last two verses are excellent as far as an application of the chapter. He has searched me. He knows me very well. He sees me and is present everywhere I go. With your power, reveal to me what is evil or what is offensive to you in me so that I can tear that sin out, so that I can defeat it, so that I can kill it. Continue to sanctify me. Continue to purify me. Continue to make me more like Christ every day. Make my way your way. Make my cause your cause. God's greatness is beyond all measure, and this should make us want to put him first in our lives. We should seek to understand God's cause. Learn what he wants for you. Learn what he wants from you. What is his way? How amazing is it that this God wants a personal relationship with us? Over the years, <clears throat> I've had a ridiculous amount of bosses and managers. If you work in corporate America, you know what an impromptu team meeting with no, nothing in the subject line in five minutes means. It means... Who's my manager going to be? Who are my managers going to be? Do I get to be a manager this time? The word or the phrase reorg or reorganization is one you're deeply acquainted with. My first thought going into one of these meetings and knowing I'm going to have a new manager is, am I going to like this person? Am I going to like working with them? There's a period of time when I was working in Crystal Lake um, I probably had six managers in six months. Um, we get a new area manager. They bring 400 branch managers in. The new person would say, this is the way. This is how we're going to do things. Next month, they get fired or promoted or quit. New manager, bring 400 managers in again. This is the way we're doing things. Okay? That happened like six times in a row. After a while, you can, almost tell the, you can almost immediately tell the good ones from the bad ones. When you have a good manager, it's like following any great leader. You want to work hard for them. You want to please them. You start to care about the work like they do. This is David's response to the greatness of God. He wants to, complete, he wants to be completely on board with what God wants. And we should have the same response. So my conclusion... <laughs> God's greatness really is beyond our ability to fully grasp. We're like my nine-month-old daughter. She crawls up every morning <laughs> when I'm working, crawls up on my leg, in my lap. Um, she has no idea how I do what I do. That's how we are with God. We have no clue. It's not like God's just one more rung above us on the ladder. He's not on the ladder. We just, we have, we have nothing compared to what the immensity of him. He gives us enough of an idea here on earth. He condescends so we get a glimpse of him. I've heard this question a lot growing up in the church. What will we do in heaven forever? Forever. And heaven will have eternity to continue to learn about him. We'll have eternity to experience him. Let me pray. Almighty God, there's none like you. Thank you for giving us your word so we can attempt to understand your awesomeness. Please forgive us for our arrogance in thinking we can hide sin from you. We thank you and praise you for your steadfast love. Help us to see that you're the only one that can truly satisfy us. Amen. Amen.